Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Jess. Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. We're here in my garden for the 11th weekly garden tour of the 2020 growing season. 11 weeks, that's absolutely crazy that that much time has already gone by. I actually just shot a video for uh, this coming week talking about uh, thinking about the fall garden which it's it's time to kind of get that in your mind so totally crazy the summer is flying by and right now is the time where the garden is just extravagantly beautiful and so productive so let's jump right in to taking a look at it for those of you who are new here we are gardening in central arkansas zone seven a b kind of like in between the two we do all natural growing practices. We have a small farm here. My husband, myself, we're raising our kids and growing as much of our food as we can, which this year, actually, we're growing quite a bit more than we have in years past. And definitely feeling that right now as we get into the height of the season. We had a lot of rain today. Well, it wasn't just a ton, it was about two inches, which is a lot considering uh, they hadn't forecasted any. I haven't been uh, stopping up here in the cottage garden just a whole lot on these tours. I've been really focusing on our vegetables. Really kind of a shame because this is a really pretty space. It's just got a lot of weeds, honestly, and there are some things that have really gotten away from me. But uh, there is some stuff up here. Here's a random volunteer ground cherry and some of our berry bushes are getting a little bit larger. A lot of the roses are starting to bloom even though they're still pretty small in their first year. Back here, a little strawberry patch in a kiddie pool. And the kids keep this pretty well picked. Sometimes I optimistically check and we'll find a couple. Usually I don't find much. The kids do usually stay on top of it. At this point, the berries are pretty small at the beginning of the year they were really good sized they are so delicious though really full of flavor how well the strawberries did this year we had them in the kiddie pool really preferred using the green stalk because it just kept them up and they were easier to find but how well they both did this year made me definitely want to grow more strawberries it's time for me to go ahead and tear out these green stalks of beans these were bush beans and they had pretty much done uh, what they were going to do. I left some of them on here to hopefully dry up, produce uh, some seeds that I could save, but uh, these plants are, are pretty well done. I planted those right after the frost passed and have harvested quite a lot of beans off of them. I'd love to have some feedback about what you would like to see grow in my green stock towers next. We do have the one green stalk with strawberries in it. And I've been asked a lot how I planned on overwintering those. Overwintering isn't really something that I have had to spend a lot of time worrying about as a gardener in Arkansas. Last winter, my strawberries did really just fine in that kiddie pool uh, the whole winter. Strawberries can handle some pretty cold temperatures. I don't think that it gets cold enough here to really ever kill back strawberries. So if you live in a very cold place, you probably have to think about that. I was thinking about possibly moving that tower into the high tunnel if I felt like it needed it. And I'm actually thinking with these other two that I've kept here in front of the greenhouse, I think I may move those back to the high tunnel here before we replant them. And just move them back there and amend the soil that's in them and maybe plant something that can grow throughout the winter in the high tunnel. So I'm totally open to suggestions if you guys have any suggestions that you'd like to see growing in that. This garden is pretty weedy right now and to be completely honest it's probably going to stay that way a little while longer. Right now the majority of our energy is going to the food gardens and and so this is sort of just doing its own thing. I will be giving a lot of attention to this space in the fall, uh, planting a lot of bulbs for the spring. But as of right now, I mean, it's really pretty for a first year. I really love the zinnias here. They're gorgeous. We've got gladiolas. A lot of this stuff is just kind of falling back. I did want to come up here and touch on the fact that we have this asparagus bed in the front 
that this is our first year establishing it and look at it it's really really doing well um, I need to come in here and weed it pretty well I've got some vine weed here if you've got this stuff growing anywhere in your garden you want to rip that out it's wild morning glory you can see it kind of wrapping around my asparagus here it's called bind weed and it will bind stuff up really fast and choke out the plants that you want so you see those heart-shaped leaves are what you're looking for in the morning glory family and you want to get that out of your garden here in the herb spiral things are really filling out i've been picking the dill out of here here as i make pickles i've got some comfrey back here in the corner you see the weeds are pretty rough over here but there's still a lot of good stuff happening among the weeds you know we started the cottage garden this winter and i was like so excited about it and then we decided to get the high tunnel and then the, everything kind of got a little weird and I sort of shifted focus more to food. Got it all in, we still got it all in, but I didn't really give it like my best, I don't feel like. And given the exact same set of circumstances, I probably would do it the same. I think that we did the right thing by shifting to growing food. However, like getting into this season, I'm looking at it and having a lot of ideas for next year. And we always knew that that was gonna be a process, but I'm, I'm excited to see that garden. I feel like next year, it's really gonna be like in its full glory. I've got a lot of noodle beans here, which I'm gonna actually leave on here. I feel like not just a whole lot has changed since the last time we were in the garden together, but I'm sure it has. I'm sure it seems very different to you. I just see it every day, multiple times a day. The green beans here are really filling out and the okra is getting notably larger. Do y'all wanna know what okra leaves remind me of? Tree stars, don't they? Don't they look like tree stars? Who knows what I'm talking about? Any 80s kids in the house? So the okra is gets harvested every single morning and there's usually a pretty good harvest every morning. I actually need to get my basket. I wasn't gonna harvest, but I just can't walk by it. I'm gonna go ahead and grab some of these noodle beans. I could go ahead and grab those okra, but I'm gonna leave them on until tomorrow because they'll be okay for one more morning. I am so surprised at how long this season I've had good cucumbers. Usually they start getting really kind of yucky, uh, bitter, and weird shaped as the days get hotter, but I think because we've still just had so much rain that they've stayed really nice, really tasty. I also really like the silver slicer variety. Even when I miss one like this and it gets really big, they're still really good. And they've just been so prolific. If you were watching the tour last week, you saw the harvest that I pulled off of these four plants then. I've harvested another harvest about this size since then, and then now another one. These four plants have produced so much food. And so far, they seem really unbothered by the heat. I did notice like a little bit of misshapen fruit. This starts to happen whenever it gets really hot. They start to get weird shaped. They start to get really bitter, but it was really hot and dry. And today's storm, it started to rain. Uh, it rained a while today. So we'll see what happens. I would not be surprised if the cu cucumbers start winding down very soon, but I'm also, I mean, I'm pleased that they're not. Oh, I see another one. So many. Actually, the fact that cucumbers start to peter out when it gets really hot is one of the reasons why I've always also grown the Armenian white um, melon, which is used like a cucumber because they tend to handle the heat a little bit better. So now, not only do I have these producing like crazy, um, I still have cucumbers like crazy, which is pretty cool. Look at this. Is that so wild? <laughs> Usually when I grow the Armenian white in the garden, 
I only put two plants in. They are so prolific and they go so crazy. So this year I actually tried to plant both sides of the trellis. I knew that they would go wild if they both you know like got good and established but one side got scratched up by my chickens and now that it's harvest time I think that that's probably okay that that happened because like this this fruit right here is at least a pound and a half of this big old cucumber thing obviously this makes a lot of pickles like one of these will almost fully fill a half gallon mason jar. That's a lot, that's a lot of food uh, to do something with. My plan for these is actually to make like a, like a pickle relish. This little wild accident, I did not plan on being in this spot, but I'm glad I decided to go ahead and leave it. This is spreading out so much that I think it may very well take off, take over a large majority of this 16 foot panel here. It is, really beautiful this is a volunteer melon i actually don't know yet what kind it is because it doesn't have any fruit set but last year in this place i had a melon called a chrysanthemum kiko chrysanthemum melon which is a really small white melon it feeds like one person and we really enjoyed it and i didn't plant any more of them this year because i didn't have seeds so when this volunteered i decided to let it grow my banana plants are probably nine to 10 feet tall. Really big and beautiful. Here you can see these plants are really just filling out this Delis Stella table melon. It's setting some small little melons on it, but they're not very big yet. Trying to keep that for the most part trained up the trellis. It's actually climbing over the trellis on the other side. Look at these yellow canary zinnias. Are these not so beautiful? They're huge. I'm waiting on these yellow banana peppers to get just a little bit darker yellow before I pick them, but the plants are loaded. They're falling over. They're so covered in fruit. And here, oh my goodness, look at this. So there's a little bit of maybe some kind of powdery mildew going on here in the center of this plant, which is not surprising. It's so full. The fruits just get so massive so fast but they stay really good even when they get big so i don't know this one might be too big to be great but it'll be fine for relish well now this is just silly what the heck <laughs> what am i gonna do with all of this <laughs> There's still a bunch on there that are hanging. Look at this. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I see like multiple smaller ones. Golly. I think I'm gonna have to start using a harvesting wagon instead. Wow, what the heck are these things? Armenian white, uh, kind of like cucumbers. RPGs? <laughs> what does RPG mean? Rocket propelled grenade. Oh. oh. Golly. Yeah. That's a lot of relish. Might as well throw my little beans in there too. I've been picking leeks and dehydrating them and you can hardly tell uh, based on my row here that I've picked as many as I have. Again, look at all this. Look at these noodle beans. These are so crazy prolific. They just keep growing. I'm a, I was I was completely ready to pull these and they started setting flowers again. Dragon tongue bush beans. Look at that. Is that not so beautiful? <laughs> Maya is hauling that basket full of cucumbers up to the house. I've been using my dehydrator a lot this week and what I've started to do when I have like a small harvest of green beans, like these plants doing a few extra flowers whereas I thought they were done and I picked, you know, kind of some odds and ends ones off of those on the green stalk, uh, the ones that I wasn't letting dry up to save seeds. Uh, and I'm just putting them in the dehydrator and I'm essentially doing a jar right there in the pantry by the dehydrator of like mixed veggies 
that are dehydrated for soup. I was on looking at a website to buy some herbs, some bulk herbs, and they sold like a vegetable soup mix, which was dehydrated. I think they had bell peppers, green beans, peas, corn, uh, maybe parsley and maybe some other herb and it was all just a dried dehydrated mix of these things and the idea was that if you were making a soup you could throw in a cup of this dried mix and they would reconstitute in the broth and you would have like vegetables added to your soup and it kind of got me thinking like well that would be really easy to make and it would be a great way to use up you know if you harvest 15 green beans and you've got you know six kids to feed 15 green beans is not going to do anything and so i could just take those along with maybe a handful of tomatoes or a squash or whatever you know and just do a tray in the dehydrator of odds and ends things and add to the jar as i need it and have a vegetable soup mix so that's what these little uh, random dragon tongue bush beans will go into also I showed this week making basil which this variety is just like an Italian basil I have right here next to this some lettuce leaf basil these are like a smaller plant here's here's a lettuce leaf that's a bigger plant um, these get really large and I showed picking basil and making pesto. And many of you talked about how you like to freeze pesto in ice cube trays. And I have always read that and I've never done that. I eat pesto all through the season where it's in season. But basil is one of those things that I kind of take for granted because it does grow so well here. And so much of the year I have an excess of basil out in the garden. And, so and I always wish once we get into the winter that I had saved more basil. I always dry a bunch of it, but I wish I had more ways to eat it in the winter. And so I'm going to come and harvest a bunch of my basil because it'll grow back and it's trying to go to seed as it is. So I'm gonna harvest a whole lot of that and make a bunch of pesto and freeze it in ice cube trays to have in the freezer. So thank you for sharing that idea with me. Oh, look, get my beautiful giant sunflowers. This one's opened. And then a few back here have opened. They're so gorgeous. Look at the stalk on this thing. It's seriously like this big around. It's, it's huge. So beautiful. One little lone strawberry on my strawberry tower. I'll take it. Oh, they taste so good. Speaking of dehydrating, this morning we got a really good sized cherry tomato harvest and it's getting to be about time to start putting those in the dehydrator. We have a video from, I think it was last summer, Maya and Malia showed how to dehydrate cherry tomatoes because that's her job uh, in the summer. Malia is always the one who stays on top of picking and dehydrating the cherry tomatoes. And she's already stated that she's really, really gonna miss the tomatoes. <laughs> wow, look under here. This kakuzi gourd has just taken over. It's moved over to the trellis next to it. And I'm just letting it have it. I'm not trying to redirect it because this had some cucumbers that just never took off really well and they have started to really die back and obviously these plants were not going to be contained on just one cattle panel this is just bonkers i have noticed that i don't have just a ton of fruit on here i've got a couple i've picked a couple but um someone messaged me and asked if i was having to hand pollinate these and I thought, well, I haven't been hand pollinating them, but maybe I should be because a lot of the flowers are just drying up. And then I noticed this when I came out here earlier, which is a tiny little kakuzi with a dried up blackened end. And then I noticed that over here, uh, I've got one set. I've got a couple little babies here that look to be pollinated, a couple more that are blackened a couple more that are starting to develop. And the fact that there's more developing over here where there's more airflow and access makes me think these are getting pollinated. And maybe with this being so uh, filled up that maybe they're not. I showed you that one with a really brown dried up end. Um, you see that in squash also. If you, if you are seeing squash and you're thinking, why do these have blossom end rot? 
it's probably not blossom end rot. That that brown squishy end, um, it's it's different than the dark scab that a tomato gets when it has blossom end rot. It's probably when they're really small and they they get mushy and brown on one end like that on the blossom end is probably improper pollination. If you're seeing that in your squash or like your kakuzi gourds, obviously, it they it, try hand pollinating. And all you have to do to hand pollinate your squash, I probably can show you this right now. I've got some squash over here, and I think there are blossoms. Yeah, squash produce male and female blossoms, and Sometimes you will have a plant that produces a lot of male blossoms before it produces female blossoms. Sometimes you'll have a plant that produces female blossoms before it produces male blossoms. And if the plant can't cross the two together, you won't get fruit. A female blossom, which this plant actually has a handful of male blossoms, which are all falling off and it doesn't have any fruit on it because it hasn't produced any female blossoms yet. A female blossom basically will have a stem and it'll have like a little miniature immature fruit, like a little baby tiny squash looking thing on the stem. I can't show you that because I don't have one. A male will have a long uh, stem and the inside of the blossom looks like this. So yeah, this needs to get to the inside of the female blossom. Um, this has the pollen on it as you can see right here. And uh, if you just take, you can kind of see all that yellow coming off of my hand, you can take a toothbrush or a paintbrush. Um, what I've done lots of times is just taken the male blossom just like this, peeled the flowers back and gone and rubbed this to the inside of the female blossoms because you're just trying to get this pollen to the inside of the female squash blossoms. And then they'll be pollinated. And then that fruit can grow. Um, and it needs enough pollen in there to pollinate that fruit. And if that's done right, that fruit won't dry up. It will grow. So there's your squash sex ed for the day. You know, nature is a lot of things, but it is never boring, that's for sure. So here I've actually got some freshly planted rose bushes. They came in a while ago, but I just hadn't put them in yet. They really needed to be transplanted. So I'm hoping they all take really well. Those are all the David Austin roses that I got a little while ago. Here are some other roses that are taking off really well. Uh, looking really nice. We got these beds freshly mulched. This is some ginger growing. I'm hoping that it takes off. There are a couple other little sprouts just starting to pop through the mulch there. Lovely roses. They're getting really big. Here you can see, this is the Ancash Market Cucumber, and they were pretty good while they lasted, but they've started to get weird with the heat, and this plant has just started to dry up, and it's succumbed to something. I don't know what, if it was cucumber beetles or what. So I'm not really sure. These other cucumber plants have got some powdery mildew over on this side. Honestly, the Silver Slicer just like totally stole the show for me this year. Uh, that has been one of my favorite cucumbers I've ever grown. It's just been so consistently good. Uh, the cucumbers are good, small and large. I'll definitely grow that one again. Um, and I like other ones. It's not that I don't like them, but like what that Ancash Market cucumber is doing is exactly what I expect cucumbers to be doing by now. The Silver Slicer just hasn't done it. So that's pretty cool. Got some pretty marigolds here. You can see the tomatoes. We'll get over there and look at those in a second. So I have some really big green fruits in here and some are changing. Uh, I've got a mixture of marigolds. This is a volunteer red Malabar spinach. This, these beds have a lot of space. Here are some young melons. I don't even know what variety this is. My chickens scratched this up so many times that I kept replanting it with melons and I would throw different ones in. So I have no idea what this is. I'll know whenever it ripens. Look at those Brad's Atomic Grape Tomatoes. They're just starting to turn. These are such weird little tomatoes. Malia sure does love them though. I've got like four plants right there. This is a Roselle. Uh, this is the only one I think that I still have that I planted. Do you see the tree star again? It's kind of got a very similar shape of leaf. This is more pointy than an okra where they're wider. Um, but this is a relative of okra. They're both in the marshmallow family as well as hibiscus. All very good for you. This is I'm growing for tea. More young melons, also a mystery. And as you can see, I've just got 
companion planted basil and marigolds all over just plugged in this was an nasturtium but it's dried up with the heat and here um some volunteer okras which that needs to be harvested and i don't have any snippers out here so i just have to make sure i get that in the morning and this is a volunteer ground cherry which yeah there's a couple here this will be the pineapple variety because that's what we've grown in here before. So for this to be a volunteer, it's got to have reseeded from past years. Ground cherries you harvest off the ground. They fall off when they're ripe. And sometimes what I'll do is just, if I see one yellow hanging on the plant, I just kind of wiggle it. And if it falls off in my hand, I know it's ready. I've been told by Aussie viewers that these are called Cape gooseberries in Australia. Oh, this one has some, this one's split. I had someone else tell me that they're not the same thing as Cape gooseberries, that it's actually a different variety, uh, but they're all related to tomatillos and they grow in a husk. They turn yellow when they get ripe. Uh, we've grown the pineapple variety in the past and the ant mollies. They're very similar. One of the things is though, in the past, we've had a, like a lot of issues with pests with our ground cherries. We've never had enough because everybody loves them. They taste really good. They're very fruity. And we've never had enough to actually make anything out of. And I've been told that they're great for like jams and hand pies and like sweet things like that. And I would assume that they would be, but I don't know because I've never made anything. Uh, salsa, someone said they make really good salsa. I'm hopeful though that this year we're going to be able to make something. We have several plants in the high tunnel and then probably about six plants up here in the front garden and in the cottage garden that have volunteered and in the kids garden. This is my sad sterile tomatillo. I had two. Uh, one of them got killed by chickens and tomatillos need more than one in order to cross pollinate. And I keep meaning to start another one and then not. So I just have this thing here reminding me of my failure. More Malabar spinach, which I moved from volunteers over here. It's starting to grow really nicely up this trellis it's gonna be really pretty it's wild tangle our cucumelons which we're getting a lot of some gherkin cucumber cucumbers these are starting to do the weird like kind of misshapen thing and kind of starting to brown and get a little crunchy in some places so i don't know how much longer those are going to last but the cucumelons have taken over these trellises and then i have all this tulsi holy basil here that reseeded this smells so good. I wish I could just let you smell it. Started harvesting the beets here. I mentioned beet powder in my vlog um, about how I was dehydrating beets. My friend Jill at Whispering Willow Farm did a video about that and she uses it in like smoothies and like puts it into baked goods and stuff like that. And so that was my plan with a lot of my beets this year. All right, so I'm showing you how I have some yellow, some browning on my tomato plants. I actually usually have quite a bit more of that at this point in time. I think just the season got started a little late so my tomatoes are lasting a little longer. Um, got a lot of fruit here. I picked a couple of these big ones the other day. I'm gonna go ahead and pick this one. Oh, I should really do this with snippers. And I had multiple people comment and say, those tomatoes aren't ready yet. Look at the green on them. However, when you have massive tomatoes like this, a lot of times these are from fused blossoms. That's what's going on here. You see the seam and this little kind of hole. That's not a bug hole, that's just how it grew because this grew from multiple blossoms fused together. And when that happens, a lot of times you'll have unripe spots and spots that are so ripe that they start getting really soft. My personal stance on when to pick a tomato like this is when it's mostly ripe and I will let this finish ripening in the house. Even though, yes, it does have some green, I'm gonna put it on my counter, I'm, you know, in most cases won't cut into it yet but what will happen at least here where i am if i leave this outside those really ripe spots are going to start getting really soft and mushy and they are just like a target for insect damage at that point or critters or birds or whatever and so i would rather pick it when it's just slightly on the underripe side and get to eat it rather than leave it out here and to be fully vine ripened and then it be ruined by something. Most of these though, I've got several that are on the ripe side, but I don't really wanna pick them because it just rained a ton today. 
Y'all see that little spider? She, she's guarding those big ones for me though. She'll keep the she'll keep the buggies off of it. This is a variety called Rose, and it's got a couple a couple really nice fruits on it, but that one's really massive. And this is also the Rose, and it's got several that are just really big. Some of these are getting close, but I think they'll taste better if I let them dry out a little bit. Whenever a plant has just soaked up a whole lot of water, the fruit is just gonna have a lot of water in it. So the flavor is gonna be kind of diluted. Whereas if I let these all stay out, like there's one that's pretty close to ripe. Ugh, this plant's gonna have to come out. This is the Homs 11 and it's just, it's sick. I need to take it out. Now this one I will go ahead and pick because it looks like this got pecked a couple times by chickens and that's not enough for me to throw this one. Uh, if it's got a big hunk out of it a lot of times I'll throw it because I don't know what could have crawled into it but those couple little pecks I'm going to go ahead and take this one inside so I can salvage the rest of it. Look at these lots. These are Dr. Witchies right here. Some good looking ones. Turning color, I'm gonna leave those. Oh, that's a big one. That's a really big tomato right there. Uh, that's a persimmon. It's actually my first year growing that one. Got the black beauties. They sure are looking pretty. Mm, I'm not seeing just a whole lot else that's super noteworthy. There's a nice Cherokee purple starting to blush. That plant has a lot of big fruits on it. None are just monsters or anything, but they're all really good size. It's starting to get dark, so we're going to go to the back so we can take a look. This looks different, huh? We'll take a look at that in a second. First, I want to go in here because it's getting a little dark, and this is going to get dark faster. Oh, look at this glorious place. So Ben Turn was actually out here today applying some of his ingenuity. Ben turns really good at kind of like figuring stuff out and basically I didn't want to come down and individually stake each of these peppers because that would just be a lot of work to individually stake them. And so I asked him to see what he could come up with and he put these T-posts down on the end and he did this twine and basically it goes down tightly on each side and holds the plants up and then there's another string that goes and zigzags through to hold these up because basically these pepper plants were starting to get really heavy and they were falling over um, and as you can see we've got a lot of peppers on these plants they're very very heavy these are the banana peppers now you can see this is the same plant that's up in the front. The ones in the front are very heavy laden, but these plants are just a lot bigger. And so I think over time they're gonna produce more, which is not surprising being in this controlled environment. Some young bell peppers here. These pepper beds are just very full and the plants are really starting to set a lot of fruit. The chili, lots of these little mirasol chilies that point upwards. These are uh, Pasilla Bajio, I think they're called. A lot of these, these are for drying. So the, these plants are kind of laid over right now, but that's just because they've just been handled a lot today, getting into this bracing and they'll start standing up here soon. They just, this just happened this afternoon. I've got a lot of fruit out here though. I'm, I'm gonna be picking and drying peppers here very soon. And the tomatoes in this high tunnel um, we've started harvesting our first few. We actually ate one of these tonight, one of the Jet Stars. It was really good. Um, I mean, it didn't blow my mind or anything, but it was definitely a good tomato. You can see here, like, like there's a little blushing, small Amish, Amish paste. Look how tall these are. Here, I have some young eggplants starting to develop. This is just like a classic eggplant, just a big regular one babies on these. I am seeing a little bit of yellow spotting and brown spots in the high tunnel, but not just a lot. Um, definitely less than outside. They're not perfect as they were when we first started. I just love being in here. It's really just stunning actually. The plants are so tall. Um, the top of this plant, of course it's in a deep raised bed, but the top of that plant is 
probably about that's about nine feet up they've grown so much now I will tell you I was out here with Ben turn today and I was kind of showing him some different things that we were looking at and troubleshooting and I definitely saw what I am certain was hornworm damage and hornworm poop you can kind of see some little areas where you've got like little, just little sticks and stumps that are chewed off here's some more and that is pretty telltale signs of hornworms which uh, means I'm gonna get out here with the black light I think we're gonna do it tonight as soon as it gets dark Maya said he would come come hornworm hunting with me so the hybrid bed, you can see all that fruit along the bottom. There's a lot of baby th fruit throughout the leaves. They definitely have a ton of fruit set, but this climbing triple crop bed, while it, they took longer to set fruit, you can see they don't have a lot of fruit set so low to the ground. Uh, they grew a lot of leaves first, but when they did start setting their fruit, they're getting really large. So we've got a lot of large fruits on these. See, here are our ground cherries. And we use this white woven fabric to be able to get the fruits um, because in the past they've fallen to the ground and been eaten by bugs. Now we've got a lot of them growing up in the front that are not being eaten by bugs. But I'm not mad. I'm not mad that we've got ground cherries all over the place and that they're doing well. That is a black beauty that's just barely starting to blush right there. You can just barely see that it's changing colors. I moved all the onions out of here inside. The Abe Lincoln varieties down here, they they took a little while longer to set fruit, but now they're setting a lot. There's a lot of little baby fruits on these. These are so tall. And the fruits that they are growing are all huge. Just completely massive. Every single one of them that's on here is is looking to be like a pound and a half tomato, which is exactly why I grew this variety. Last year, I went to Doug and Stacy's event in Hannibal, Missouri last August. My friend Jessica from Baker Creek was there and she brought like a display of fruit that they'd grown at Baker Creek and they had an Abe Lincoln tomato that was close to three pounds. And I thought then I need to grow that. And then um, I went to the expo last year and saw another nearly three pound Abe Lincoln. And that it, it was like a definite on my list. I've actually never grown it before, but I've heard so many good things that I put like 10 plants in the high tunnel and then they didn't set any fruit for a while. And I was like, oh man, but now they, they're definitely looking like they're gonna be uh, worth it. All right, now our last little area. I told you guys I was gonna do this, but it is kind of sad looking now that it's done tore out all the summer squash. The squash bug infestation was just intense. And in tearing those out, these okras will have uh, kind of a little more freedom to just grow. Literally are harvesting the okra every morning. And then by the next day, we have multiple good sized pods on there. You can see they're just really starting to produce a lot. This row of okra here is gonna grow a ton of food. So I was walking out here looking at these plants and uh, realized something that I had done. I've had kind of some confusing things going on here. I had some, I had some winter squash that were growing here and you can see these are, these are struggling because the squash bugs too. So another reason why I went ahead and tore out the summer squash because I wanted these winter squash to get to ripen. I don't know if they're gonna be able to. But you see this big, big guy here? Here's another one. Looks like a big old butternut. There's some small melons that are ripening. And here we've got all these melons kind of going over here into the sweet potatoes and there's some squash. All those big butternut looking ones and then look at this random big thing. Looks kind of like a sweet meat or a kabocha. I implant those sweet meats right here. I implant butternuts right here. You know what I planted was a little variety called honey nut. A small uh, like personal size butternut, really, really good. Um, here's one. This is what that's supposed to look like. This is supposed to ripen to like a nice orangey butternut color. So when I first started seeing like this, the kind of weird shaped squash come up, I thought, well, I know I planted some sweet meats in the back. Maybe I, maybe I mixed up and planted some up here and I just don't remember. 
But then I started seeing the big butternuts and I was like, no, I know I didn't plant butternut squash up here because I planted a lot of that in the back. And I got to thinking about it. I was like, where did I get those seeds? Now I have some true honey nuts up here at the front that are growing. I got those seeds from Hudson Valley Seed Company. Those were the right seeds. But at some point I decided I'm gonna plant more of those honey nuts. And I grabbed a little plastic baggie of seeds inside my kitchen and brought them back out here that I saved out of squash from Trader Joe's. And uh, that's where all of these random squash are coming from because there's no telling what that could have been cross-pollinated with. There's no telling where that grew. Um, and it's fine. Those are gonna be, I mean, they seem to be edible good squash, but that's kind of the risk that you run when you save seeds from store-bought food. Um, obviously it's growing squash some people say well that's not sustainable i mean it's food i just don't know exactly what it's going to taste like or be like it they seem to be mostly like butternuts so I, i'm assuming that's mostly what those seeds grew was that honey nut cross with the butternut but um you know it's food it's squash that's the risky run whenever you just save seeds willy-nilly but guess what i'm gonna keep doing saving seeds willy-nilly because you know, <laughs> the sweet potatoes just going crazy. We're gonna have so many sweet potatoes. Very excited about that. And back here in this hot mess, you can see we cut down all the sunflowers and fed what was left of them to the goats. Those were just cutting sunflowers, so we weren't trying to mature them for seeds. And here, and we're having a lot of squash bugs here as well but there are a lot of squash laying throughout here and i'm just hoping that they have the time to finish ripening check this out now well, that's a sweet meat that i actually planted its run is still really soft i mean right here i see like one two three four five i see so many squash down in here i'm not going to traipse through that right now i don't have the right shoes on for that and over here on this side, we have a lot of watermelons that are growing. They're all up in this weedy area. And these are like called like a colossal, it's some sort of colossal cantaloupe. I was just noticing several of those, several pumpkins turning orange. Even though this is a big mess, it's gonna yield us a lot of food. The yield of that back garden to me is very, very encouraging because that was such an afterthought that that whole little area i had kind of thought i think i'd like to put something in here and then ben turn was over here one day and he'd brought his tiller uh his his dad had a tiller and he just brought it and literally in just one afternoon we tilled that up with the tiller threw some compost down on top of it i went out there planted the entire thing from seeds and in three months it's now just covered up in food and I have not spent a lot of time weeding it. I think I mulched it like once or twice. So very, very little effort on my part and potentially growing, I mean, a lot of food. That's a lot of squash. If that all ripens, that's crazy. And every time I come back here, even though I'm faced with some failures, I keep looking at that being like, you know, with the garden, some things you work really hard for and some things you actually don't. There are some things in gardening that if you're willing to just take a risk, you might end up uh, gaining a lot for, for very little uh, investment. I, get, I don't know if you can really tell this on the camera. It's getting very dark right now. So I'm gonna wrap this up. I think we've seen pretty much everything. There are a couple of things I didn't touch on, but there's always next week. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I bless you, until next time.